any problem uh yes a little bit i i will check uh we are broadcasted but there is not uh so i i just check what happened Just give me. Yes, sir. We are now live. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I request Tamina to start. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining. This is our 65 webinar in this series. And today's webinar is very special for all of us. All of us, when we are start our journey in BSc, MSc, we always follow few textbooks and most of uh, written by... Uh, Professor P. K. Gupta, and uh, we are very glad he is accept our invitation. It's very, very new platform Bioengine. We just started in two thousand twenty, but uh, we are very happy. People are connecting uh, very fast with the Bioengine, and we are bring we are able to bring such eminent personality in this platform. Today, uh, I request him that we all know your success story. I already shared many of his publications, published Plant Biotech Journal also uh, published a special issue on him. So, uh, but our focus will be today is uh, the failures part and uh, what will be the suggestion, what we should do, uh, what will be uh, our role in modern agriculture, in uh, in mod in uh, progress of our nation's cultivate uh, agriculture and others neighboring countries uh, in Asia and uh, related countries. So we are glad we received about two thousand two hundred registrations uh, from um, more than seventy countries in the in in this for this webinar. And uh, as you know, we'll give the certificate uh, for the participation who already registered for it and the link will come at the end so please don't put the request for certification and feedback during the webinar you put your questions we like to, i i am i am collecting all the questions my friend dr tamina islam from dhaka university department of botany today helped me to conduct this webinar I hand over to Tamina to introduce Bioengine, to introduce uh, Sir, and uh, obviously what we are going to say is very limited, very few of uh, his achievements. There are a lot of achievements he did, uh, not only the um, academically, socially, and obviously for teaching. And uh, he uh, teaching is uh, is his passion, and his book help us to. Uh, know the subject very much other than the plant science and cytology. So, Tamina, it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Shubham. Uh, good morning and hello to everyone. Welcome to Bioengine Webinars. Bioengine is a non-profit organization created to promote plant research worldwide. This is a platform from which plant scientists can present their research to the world. We hope future scientists can gain perspective and inspiration by listening to the esteemed plant researchers talk about their scientific accomplishment and their thoughts on building the future plant sciences. 
We are grateful to our guest speakers to have accepted our invitation to share their research insights with us. We are also thankful to you, the viewers of our Bioengine family, for your interest in Bioengine webinars, your constant support and appreciation. We have received a huge response to the registrations for today's webinar. As Tribute mentioned, it is 2,200 almost. We, you can register for more such webinars through our website, bioengine.com, and social media pages. You are live viewing this webinar, and you can watch it again later on in the Bioengine YouTube channel. So please remember to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of our live events. After attending today's talk, you can apply for a certificate of participation via the feedback link, which will be provided in the YouTube our chat after the presentation. Please type your questions related to today's talk in the YouTube chat box for the question and answer session. Now, uh, it will be my honor to introduce Professor P.K. Gupta. Dr. Pushpendra Kumar Gupta earned his BSc in 1956 and MSc in 1958 from Agra University. He worked at Mirat University, uh, Mirat College, Mirat, and DAV College, Muzaffar Nagar for a brief period and then joined Gorakhpur University in 1960 where he used to taught and conducted research in cytogenetics. He joined the University of Manitoba, Canada for his PhD degree in 1967 in, uh, on a Commonwealth scholarship. After his return from Canada, he served at uh, Gorakhpur University for two years, then joined Mirat University again in 1969. He worked as professor, head of the Department of Agricultural Botany, and also dean of faculty of agriculture at Mirat University. He continued there and active service till his retirement in 1996. Later on, as an emeritus scientist and professor, he was INSA senior scientist during 2003 to 2006. He visited UK, Germany, and Canada for several times for high studies and also collaborative research in the field of plant cytogenetics, molecular biology, and biology. For the academic accomplishment and achievements, Dr. Gupta extensively worked on different areas of plant cytogenetics, induced mutation, and quantitative genetics, utilizing both classical and molecular approaches. He mainly worked in cereals and lipids. Not only that, he also conducted research in the area of induced mutation, biomedical uh, genetics, and release of a mutant variety in Mungbin, MUM2. More recently, he has established a wheat biotechnology laboratory at Mira and conducted research leading to detection of marker trait association and also marker aided selection for a number of traits in Vir. He has authored more than a dozen of textbooks and published over 350 research articles and mentored a large number of students, including 70 PhD students. Not only in academic purposes, Dr. Gupta was also involved in other uh, contributions. For example, he brought Mirat on the international map in the field of crop genetics, gen cytogenetics, and biotechnology. He edited several volumes on topical subjects. He is on the editorial board of NASI and INSA Proceedings, Indian Journal of Genetics, Plant Breeding, and International Journal on Plant Genetics. Dr. Gupta received several awards, including Agra University Gold Medal for standing first in MSc, Lakshmi Devi Tamman Gold. Medal in standing first in faculties of arts and science in Mira College in 1958. He also the recipient of Normal H. Gill Memorial Gold Medal in 1998, Chowri Charan Singh Vidya Vidyalaya Gaurav Award in 2003, Birbal Sahani Gold Medal by Indian Botanical Society in 2004. He was elected to the Fellowship of National Academy of Sciences India, Allahabad in 1978. Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, 1989, and National Academy of Agriculture and Science, New Delhi, in 1991. This is a very short and brief uh, introduction to Professor P.K. Gupta. He has much more achievements and everything we all know by him. Sir, with your permission, should I uh, share your presentation? Yes, yes, please do it. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, 345 people are live watching from YouTube. Huh? Okay, okay, fine. So <laughs> there is a people. Uh, we are here three, but there is a 343 people are watching live to you.
sir, I have shared your presentation. Just Very good. tell me now so that I can change the slide. Yes. yes. This, this presentation actually is a presentation which I made on my 85th birthday when my department celebrated my 60, my 85th birthday some two, three years ago. And you see, because I completed my master's degree in 58 and then started research, so it completes almost 65 years of research. But these 65 years of my career have been full of opportunity, challenges, serendipity, and good luck. I have used these four adjectives very carefully, opportunities, challenges, serendipity, and good luck. Opportunities mean I got opportunities when I never expected it, but I never lost the chance of utilizing the opportunities when we had it. I had many challenges during my career when people thought that I will not be able to do it, and I demonstrated that I can do it even at a place like Merit. Because many people during these 65 years thought, why did I stay at Merit? Many people used to question me, even today, people think because Dr. Swaminathan and many others requested me and offered me that they will get me a position in an agricultural university. But for some reason, I stayed back to Merit because I had some affiliation with Merit and I thought I should demonstrate that I can do what others are doing at, at other places. Our department actually started with Professor R.B. Singh and Punjab Singh also. In 69, we were the three persons in agriculture field, Dr. Ram Badan Singh, Punjab Singh and myself. R.B. Singh and Punjab Singh left within three years in 72 and you know that they occupied very, very important positions, both of them. But I stayed back. I stayed back. They went into administration and did a lot of administration, but left research. But I continued research. And despite all administrative responsibility, which I had in this university of Chaudhary Char 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 Charan Singh University, which uh, used to be Merit University earlier. And during these 65 years, I never stopped. I never stopped. At times when I did not have research facilities, I concentrated on book writing also. And one of the examples is that 1990. Hello, Ali. Yes. So I was telling you that I never stopped research, but I did stop for a few years when my bo both my one son and one daughter they needed my attention and also because I wanted to start work in molecular biology and facilities in molecular biology were not available. That was about from 90, I should say from 1990 to about 95. But as, as the title of this lecture say, says, I got opportunities. After my retirement, I was actually planning that I should stay home. I built a room particularly for the purpose of studying and reading and writing, but never utilized that facility. Because in 96, Chitranjan Bhatia, who was the Secretary Department of Biotechnology, invited me to Delhi. He used to like me somehow and told me that why did I not apply for any grants and funds to do with DBT? And I told him that I thought I will not get it. So he told me that I have to develop a lab in wheat biotechnology at Merit and he will provide me with first whatever I want. So I gave him a proposal for a three-page proposal and he sanctioned the money within no task force, no, no reviewing within three days, within about a week, he sanctioned me what I wanted. 
and that started Akhilesh Tyagi in Delhi University says that it was a reincarnation. In 1996-97, my retirement was celebrated. Many people attended from India and abroad also. We had a symposium in 1997 after I retired. And during that symposium, Akhilesh Tyagi remembered that and he said that he attended my retirement and then I had reincarnation and from 1996 till today, never stopped. Never stopped. Fortunately, funding agencies also cooperated, kept on giving me funds. And this is how many of my colleagues in the country say that I did more research after retirement than I did before. And my list of publications uh, is now for more than 500. It's mentioned 350, but because that was an old, <laughs> old uh, CV, but now I've crossed uh, 500. And you know that during this period after my retirement, I produced some of the students, including Rajiv Varshne, who became Fellow of Research, Fellow of Royal Society London. So friends, also, when I completed my, my master's degree in Merit College, Dr. Puri, V. Puri, Vishambha Puri, was my supervisor. I wrote a thesis on morphological nature of the ovule of Texas Baqueta. This was a gymnosperm. And I enjoyed doing that work. And this was appreciated by P. Maheshwari and B.M. Johri at Delhi University also. And they invited me if I would like to go and work there in Delhi University. Dr. Vipuri did not like it. And he offered me options that I can become a lecturer, I can do a CSIR fellowship, or I can join a project which was recently sanctioned to him. But my senior friends told me that I will have no future in morphology. And therefore, I decided that I will not continue in morphology. And therefore, after my master's degree, I did accept a research problem from Dr. Vipuri, but did not really take any interest. So for two years, I did no research, 1958 to 60, concentrated on teaching. And that too, more in 1959-60, when I was in DAV College, Muzaparnagar, because in Merit College, I was a lecturer for about a year, but did not do any teaching because they did not assign any lecture work for me. They only asked me to conduct practical examination, practical of the BSc, BSc students. So that one year, 1958 to 59, was a year when I did nothing. Wasted my time, enjoyed myself. But 1959 to 60, when I was in DAV College in I worked very hard because I had to teach all subjects of botany, including plant physiology, genetics, morphology, you name. And students became very happy with me and DAV College, when I got appointment at Gorakhpur University, DAV College wanted me to stay back. They were making head of the department of a postgraduate department. But then I thought that I will not have any future in a college. Therefore, I moved to Gorakhpur University. So this, this slide show will show you some of the progress which I made. And I will keep on telling you how I made the progress. I can have the next, next slide, please. You see, one of the major event, I told you that I had good luck, serendipity. I met people whom I never expected to meet and they helped me. Dr. S.C. Gupta was a professor of botany at Government College Nainital. And he belonged to Meerut. His wife belonged to Meerut. And therefore, he was there and he had a vacancy at Nainital for a position of a lecturer. And uh, people told me that I should go and meet him. I went and met him. And he told me that the position which he advertised was already filled up. And therefore, he will not be able to help me, except that he could introduce me. By Dr. S.C. Gupta to Professor K.S. Bhargav, changed my life. Changed my life because Dr. K.S. Bhargav, when he saw my, my CV, he was greatly impressed. 
and he thought that this young boy can do anything. And therefore, he invited me to join the department on the condition that I will teach genetics and forget about morphology. And I accepted this challenge. I never studied genetics in my master's, but full course in genetics. I had to teach in Gorakhpur University for four years before I left for Canada on a Commonwealth scholarship to complete my PhD. Next, please. Yes, you see, this is Professor K. S. Bhargo, whom I can never forget because he was the person who really was responsible for changing my life. He thought that I can teach genetics even if I did not study it myself. And therefore, he appointed me as the lecturer in an interview where there were about, about 25 foreign PhDs. And he selected me because I, he thought that I had the potential potential of teaching genetics and become a geneticist. You see, he was himself a plant pathologist. So he could ask me that I should do PhD in plant pathology, but he did not do it. He asked me to teach genetics and do research in genetics, a new area for me. And I accepted this challenge, which gave rich dividends to me in the following years. Next, please. This is another person. At Gorakhpur University, I met Professor R.P. Roy. I met him actually at Allahabad University also, where I was interviewed for lectureship. And he was also impressed with me. And therefore, he thought that if I want to continue and do, do research in cytogenetics, he will help me. And in 1961, when I met him, he invited me to Patna University to learn the techniques. And I used to go to Patna University every holiday, which I spent there at Botany Department, Patna University, and he used to love so much, love me so much, that he offered me all the facilities, living facilities and everything. And therefore, within four years of my stay in Gorakhpur, when I visited Patna University a number of times, I did some research on grasses of Gorakhpur. He asked me to work on grasses of Gorakhpur. So in the morning, six o'clock on a bike, I used to go and collect grasses and come back and do meiotic studies in these grasses that made me ready for submitting a PhD thesis in 1964. But my PhD thesis was never submitted because I stayed for two, three months at Patna University with my thesis, with the intention of submitting it. And Professor R.P. Roy was a leisurely person. He never wanted to work hard. And he told me that he will look after and correct my thesis whenever he has time. And this was never done. So he told me that you go to Canada and do your PhD there. This PhD is nothing. So I then, without submitting my thesis, which was really written, complete thesis was written, I left for Canada and did my PhD later on. Next, please. See, this is what I did at Patna University. I learned how to study meiosis using anthers. And he studied grasses of Gorakhpur, published my first paper on the taxonomy, grasses of Gorakhpur in Indian forester, and then also studied on apomixis in grasses. Because while studying meiosis in, in grasses, I came across uh, some of the taxa which had abnormal meiosis, and that led to led me to study apomixis and published a few papers in apomixis in grasses also. And as, as I told you, I completed my PhD thesis, but never Never submitted. Next. Then in 1964, as introduced, I availed Commonwealth Scholarship and completed my PhD in a record period of two and a half years. I went in September 64 and came back in April 67. Within two and a half years, a thesis in which I used to count chromosome numbers of over 60, 70 plants every day. So I used to work from 7 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock in the night. I used to pick up the last bus for my for my residence. And during this period, my wife also, because uh, before going, I got married, and but my wife could not accompany me. So he, she joined me in 1965. And uh, she also had to spend difficult time because I hardly had any time for her. But she... she helped me in, in many ways. The problem which I handled there, you see, a supervisor, a PhD supervisor, 
should give you a problem which is workable. There should be no uncertainty. This is the advice which I give. Because if you give a problem and then after one year you change the problem, the student suffers. But B.C. Jenkins, who was the secretary organizer of the first International Wheat Genetics Symposium in 1958, he was my supervisor and he gave me a problem using rye monosomic substitution. Wheat rye substitution lines was a major project in, Gor in Manitoba University and he gave me seed of three important lines which were monosomic substitution lines a wheat chromosome replaced by one rye chromosome. And he wanted me to determine, work out the homologous relationship between the rye chromosomes and the wheat chromosomes. I did not even know at the time that chromosomes can be substituted. But this was a big project and, and after giving this project, he never supervised me. He had to leave the university next year and I was at my own throughout my PhD work with no supervision except that the seed was given to me and the problem was explained what I have to do and therefore without any supervision. This is why I say sometimes that I had hardly any mentor in my life. I have no paper published anywhere with my mentor or my supervisor. I had no paper with Professor K. S. Bargo. I had one or two papers with Professor Arpiroy and had no paper with my PhD supervisor, B.C. Jenkins, and later on I was placed under the supervision of another person, Ed Larter, who joined in place of B.C. Jenkins, and he did not know very much. Therefore, I had to submit my thesis without any correction by the supervisor. And this, of course, and then my, my PhD thesis also, I wrote two papers and gave it to my supervisor, for correction and for submission, for publication, and he did not do it. And therefore, I told him that I will publish it myself without your authorship. And therefore, I published one or two papers from my thesis without any other, in single authorship, without any supervisor. So I hardly had any papers with my mentors, as I told you. And then, working homeology between wheat and rye chromosome, and this homeology between wheat and rye chromosome, was to be determined. You see, Dr. E. R. Sears, who is the world wheat cytogeneticist, he determined homeologous relationship on the basis of morphology of the plants. Nelly tetrasomics. He compared Nelly tetrasomics with normal wheat plants, and if the Nelly tetrasomic was comparable to the normal plants, he believed that the rye chromosomes compensated for the wheat chromosome. But this was not the approach which I followed. I followed approach of compensation at the gametic level. There are two types of gametes which are formed, 20 wheat chromosome plus 21 wheat chromosomes and another was 20 wheat chromosome plus one rye chromosome. And I had to work out whether the gametes with rye chromosome can work as well as 21 wheat chromosomes. If they did, it means rye chromosome is compensating for the missing wheat chromosome. So this worked fine work for me. And I completed my PhD thesis, published a few papers. Next, please. So after more than, I came back as introduced. I came, I came back in 1967. I started working at Gorakhpur University and I was in a botany department. Therefore, you know, no field facilities were there and doing the same thing which I was doing before, going on a bike in the morning and collecting grasses and then working out the chromosome number. I got one very good student who used to work like me from morning to evening and therefore during those two years, 1967 to 69, we published a, about a dozen papers in important journals on the basis of chromosome studies in grasses. Next please. Four new areas of research I pursued during my long career, about 50 years at Gorakhpur University, chemo taxonomy, induced polyploidy. There are a number of students, mutation research, cytogenetics studies, and then, of course, biometrical, biometrical genetics. This does not include 
my work on molecular genetics, which I pursued later on. This is only 1970 to 1980. During these 10 years, when I also I joined Merit University as an associate professor or reader, and then in 1976, I became professor. And during these, these 10 years were very difficult years for me because I had competition with Ram Badan Singh, who was head of the department. And he was, of course, was not very cooperative. He did not help me very much, but I struggled and published papers. And then, of course, after he left, I had to take up the professorship and also Dean Faculty of Agriculture and built a department. Because when I became professor, I was single-man department professor and head, and no other faculty member. Therefore, I had to build the department. Therefore, uh, to cut my story short, within a five years after joining, I brought grants from state government, faculty members, about five, six faculty member positions, non-teaching positions, three, and also other grants were brought from, from UGC and by state government. And that made the my department a viable department. Next, please. And then in 1974-75, before I became professor, because I had some problem in Meerut, I thought of going abroad for another year. And I was offered Commonwealth Academic Staff Fellowship by UGC. And then I visited uh, University College of Wales, UCW Abrest with UK, where I worked with Professor Hugh Rees, fellow of Royal Society at the University College of Wales, and worked. They had the this micro density meter where cytospectrophotometry is utilized for estimation of DNA content. And this machine I used and did for for the whole year. I worked on on DNA contents, and this led to two very important publications: one on segregation of repetitive DNA in lonium and the other is nuclear DNA and cryptolaria species. One published in Nature, the other published in Chromosoma. Next, please. This is the paper I published, the only paper which I published in Nature with, with Hugh Rees. You see, there were two species, Lolium reginum and tem Temulentum, and they were very closely related. Their chromosomes in F1 will pair, and but the chromosomes and reginum were smaller, chromosomes of tambulentum were longer, but they will pair, make, giving heteromorphic bivalents. And therefore, Huries wanted me to find out that the extra DNA which is present in tambulentum, is it performing any function? Will it be eliminated? Or during segregation in F2 generation, it will be eliminated or it will stay? And the finding was that the repetitive DNA was as important as the remaining DNA, and therefore I got normal distribution, and therefore this this paper was published in Nature. Next, please. Then you see, when I became professor, I inherited five or six students who were already working on in the area of biomedical genetics, and I knew nothing in the area of biomedical genetics at that particular time. And therefore, I had to work hard, learn from the students. And therefore, there were a number of students who used to deliver lecture in the evening spare time. And I used to attend their lectures. And this is how I learned biomedical genetics. And within a few years, I became proficient. I learned from my students and then studied literature. And it became possible for me to, to supervise a number of students, about a dozen students in this area of biomedical genetics, which was a very, very important area during 1960 to 1980. Next, please. Building a department, I told you about it, and therefore I don't have to elaborate on this. Next, please. A major challenge, UGC needed I think I, I faced problems in building the department. I don't have to go into the details. But at every step during building the department, I had serious problems. And I was helped by many people like Dr. Swaminathan also because 
UGC wanted clearance from ICR and the ICR was not prepared to give clearance, but Dr. Swaminathan helped me. Next, please. Approval of state government was also not possible because state governments were very, very, very strict. But two of my known people were there. I met them and they were surprised to see me and they both helped me to get the grant from UGC. Next, please. Then, after I could build the department, I continued working on cytology and cytotaxonomy and genetics-induced mutations and plant bidding and leading to release of a mutant variety also. That is the only variety which we relieved from Merit University ever. Next, please. And then, you see, one of my students, Harishankar Srivastava, who worked at Bareilly, Bareilly University, Royal Khand University, and he used to visit Canada on a fellowship, which was called something, uh, associateship or something. And he suggested me that I did, I worked in Canada and I did, never visited Canada again. And therefore, he suggested me that I should try. And therefore, I tried. And fortunately for me, one of my old class fellows from University of Manitoba was there, George Fedak, and he helped me in getting a grant there. And therefore, from starting from 1984 to 87, 88, I used to visit Canada, Ottawa, every year for three months and publish a few papers. During these 84 to 87, I published about 25 papers in cytogenetics with the help of George Fedak, who gave me the material. He used to work for nine months and I used to work for three months. And therefore, jointly, we published about 25 papers during those three, four years. Then I also met there in Ottawa, Bernard Baum, who was a world authority in taxonomy. I published a few papers with him also because I had some interest in taxonomy also. I met another person there by chance again, Roger Wheatcroft, who was working on RFLPs in microbes. <clears throat> and he, who he, I could persuade him to help us in using RFLP technique in Hordium and he did that. And that led me into the, the work on molecular markers. And then there was another scientist at University of Manitoba the University of Ottawa, Illimar Altosa, who became famous later on. He visited India also recently. And in 1988, I was with him for six months, worked on RFLPZ notes. And as I told you earlier, from, from this work, after 1988-89, there was an international wheat genetic symposium also held in Toronto that also I attended along with my, my colleagues from Merit University. But then, because I got involved in molecular markers, RFLPs, and it was so exciting that I did not feel like doing any other research which I was doing in Merit earlier, and therefore I discontinued research for five years and wrote books, number of books, Elements of Biotechnology, my book, which became popular throughout the country and which was used for preparing syllabi in every university, including IGNO, that book was written during this period. Next, please. And after my super, superannuation, I told you, Dr. Bhatia invited me and gave me the grant. And then, again, with, with my good luck, my son was working in North Carolina, North Carolina, Raleigh. He was a computer scientist and he wanted me to visit him. And therefore, I thought that what will I do there? for two or three months. So I then, I knew that Dr. Z, B. Zhang, Zhang was there, who was a world authority on QTL interval mapping. I contacted him and he said that he was too busy, but he asked me to join the Summer Institute free of charge at North Carolina State University, which I did. And that led me into uh, quantitative genetics or, or QTL interval mapping, which I followed up in India and therefore we were the first 
to start interval mapping in India. And then, of course, more recently, I got grant from ICR, which allowed us to publish papers in the field of uh, epigenetics more recently during about, uh, say, uh, during, during the last five, five years after 2018 or 19. Next, please. This is epigenetics work, which I, I, we did, and we published a few very important papers using the techniques like methylator-sensitive amplified polymorphism, methylation, immunoprecipitation, bisulfide sequencing. All these techniques were utilized, and number of times we had to take help of people in Delhi University South Campus, Plant Molecule Biology Department, and Dr. Akhlesh Tyagi, and there was Another gentleman, Saurabh Raghonshi, they helped us in utilizing these techniques. Number of my students used to go there, stay there for a few months to learn these techniques, but successfully they conducted these studies and published a series of papers once again. Two of my students who worked on this problem are now abroad. One of them is in the USA, the other is in Canada. Next, please. Book writing activities. Dr. Majumdar wanted me to tell how I got involved in, in book writing. You see, the first book which I published was Cytology, Genetics and Evolution. And this book, I never planned to write. But in 1970, we had a project sanctioned by UGC to Dr. V. Puri, Leadership Project. Leadership Project was a project under which we were supposed to train and I update the teachers from colleges to bring them up to date in the subject. And therefore, Dr. Vipri asked me that I should take up cytogenetics and update these college teachers in that area. So I had about a month, month one month program, college teachers, about 40 college teachers used to come deliver lectures. And I used to help them in updating their lectures. And this is how we, we developed teaching material which could be compiled in the form of a book. And after the we finished that leadership project, I asked Merit University to publish this book, Cytology, Genetics and Evolution. We at no, no profit, no loss basis. The university did not agree and the news spread throughout Merit and therefore one of my students who was a publisher, he persuaded me to write this book, Cytology, Genetics and Evolution, which was published by the first book by Rastogi Publications. And that, of course, was the beginning of writing many, many books. I One of the most important book, I also edited with Swaminathan, Cytogenetics of Crop Plants, which is one of the best books on Cytogenetics of Crop Plants ever written, which was dedicated to Professor R. P. Roy, who helped me at his 60th birthday. Then another textbook, 1986, I wrote is Genetics, which I dedicated to Dr. Swaminathan on his 60th birthday. And then I wrote Elements of Biotechnology, was published in 1995, then Cell and Molecular Biology in 1999, then Plant Biotechnology in 2010, and several BSc books have been written by me more recently during the last, last three, four years. Next, please. So this activity of book writing was not my choice. I was persuaded by this publisher and then he never left me alone. He kept on asking for more and more books and I became interested in writing and re reading and writing and therefore I have about 35 books now which have been written and this became a passion for me and this is why every book involved hard work so that there are no errors. I wrote them for students and finalized every book after reading them as a student and to check whether the student will really understand what I have written. Next, please. Some issues which Majumdar mentioned in his email to me are as follows. I will briefly mention about it. Career in agriculture. My career in agriculture from botany to agriculture. You see, when I was an MSc student, even later on, I thought agriculture is not a science. And therefore, I used to hate agriculture. I thought 
I will never go to agriculture and will continue in botany. But to my good luck, when I got Commonwealth Scholarship, I was placed in Agriculture Faculty, Department of Plant Science, University of Manitoba, and I had no option. Because genetics was not available there in University of Manitoba in the Botany Department. It was available only in Department of Plant Science, Agriculture Faculty. And then that was the beginning of my career in agriculture, which I selected not by by choice, but by compulsion. And I am I was so lucky. You see, this was also an incident. I was ordained that my future will will depend upon agriculture, not in botany. I didn't have any future in botany. I had a future in agriculture. Therefore, God ordained that I should shift from botany to agriculture. And therefore, I had a lot of stress during PhD and later in my life, as I told you earlier. There were also failures in research because uh, this needs planning and sometimes I did not and did not really plan, but I had very few failures in research because I carefully chose the research problems and kept in mind always that there should be minimum failures. Therefore, I sometimes I selected very easy problems, keeping in mind that I will never fail. So failures in research also depend upon taking up a problem which may be challenging. Sometimes failures in research lead to you do outstanding research, but that was not, not the case in my my case. Failure in research were the minimum in my career. Lab and publication, ethics among, among the students. Yes, of course. That is very, very important. Laboratory and publication ethics among the students. I calculated it and I feel proud that I produced many students and at least 10% of those students, say out of 100, about 10 students, which I supervised, they were outstanding. And they did very well. They learned, but other students. You see, many students, despite the mentor after them, they don't learn. They don't learn. They complete PhD and never took up research as a career. So lab and publication ethics, I used to teach to my students. I was a very, very strict mentor, I must tell you. Many people say that, how could I do it? I mean, the timings in my lab were 7 to 7. 7 in the morning and 7 in the evening. No student could enter the lab before, after 7 o'clock. And therefore, students knew that if they, are late, if they were late, they will not be allowed entry. And then, uh, 7 o'clock, in the evening, I used to leave. Students also used to leave. So this ethics, work ethics. And because all these years, I used to sit in the lab with my students, never occupied my office. And therefore, the students could not waste time in no gossiping. They could not spend time in any other activity except research. And every step of research which they were doing was personally supervised by him. Therefore, the failures were minimum. Failures were minimum. No equipment ever went out of working condition. And therefore, there was 100% success. In anything we wanted to do, there was 100% success. And we used to publish about 20 papers every year. People throughout the world were surprised. And then... Not that I did not love my students, not that I did not socialize with my students. Every paper when published, we used to celebrate. Either at my residence or in a, in a restaurant, we would have a grand party. And that motivated, that motivated all of us. We always look forward to another party by publication. So every paper used to be followed by, by a party evening get together. <laughs> Future plant science research, that is a very, very broad topic. Majumdar has written many things about future of plant science. GM crops is one of them. Climate change is one of them. I've been delivering lectures on climate change, global warming, agriculture. We are also having research projects in these, in these areas. And then to what extent? Biofortification also, we had research, research projects. These research projects 
had success success in the in the in the sense that varieties have been developed which are resistant to heat and drought varieties have been developed which are fortified with iron and zinc and then large number of hundreds and thousands of papers have been published on the genetics of these important traits thousands of papers have been published and therefore our main focus used to be on the study of genetics we did utilize the molecular markers which were developed in molecular marker assisted selection in many cases but never could produce a variety through marker assisted selection although there are about 73 74 varieties which have been produced in india through marker assisted selection in different crops next please food security food security is the lecture which my student rajiv varshney is very fond of delivering i also delivered a few lectures on food security but this is a problem food security is a problem which i don't think we have any reason to be concerned about it i am myself confident that food security will not be a problem we will always have enough because so much is being done during the last 50 years you see swaminathan used to quote the statement of two brothers who said that india will not survive from food security famine will be there after 1970 and the indian people will not have enough to eat and dr swaminathan and his team disproved this prophecy you can see the kind of increase in food production which took place during 1970 to 1924 it is a really remarkable there is no doubt about it we have surplus we have surplus food now and therefore the kind of research activity and the kind of support which we are getting i have no reason to be worried about food security there is a enough concern among scientists throughout the world about food security and gm crops gm crops i have written several articles which i have shared with all of you and gm crops i have right from the beginning i was also a member of rcgm <coughs> review committee on genetic manipulations rcgm which used to consider the proposals on gm crops supervised the trials which was which were conducted i visited number of fields where the trials on gm crops were conducted and then of course there is there was geac genetic engineering approval committee which was later on the name was changed to genetic engineering appraisal committee by jairam ramesh and i don't think i don't think the world will ever forget this man jairam ramesh who did lot of harm to the country maybe because the security government didn't want it and surprising thing is that our even after congress government bjp government took over gm crops i thought they will approve it but they also could not approve it for whatever reason i do not want to go into the details of the reasons why the present government could not approve gm crops i have no reason to believe that gm crops will be a success will do no harm to the environment or to the human beings human health and ultimately i am sure the people will have to accept gm crops there is no doubt there is enough evidence in usa and other places that gm crops has been a success i published a recent article in 2024 on gm gm wheat bm4 variety that published paper was published in trends in biotechnology so even even gm wheat is being cultivated in many parts of the world at least about dozen countries are growing gm gm wheat also so i have no doubt in my mind there are countries who are not accepting gm crops because of whatever reasons they have but i myself have no reason to believe that gm crops will become a problem to the environment or the human health no doubt about it but people 
you see gm gm cotton for example why gm cotton was allowed in our country if it was today gm cotton will never be never be allowed it was allowed in 2002 i remember the story because gm crops gm cotton was already being grown in many parts of the country including maharashtra and this was brought to the notice of the government and government said that all this gm cotton should be burnt this is the language they used and then with the fear that farmers will agitate they had to approve it gm cotton was a, approved by the government under compulsion it was and there were no field tests there nothing uh, on which gm cotton was approved gm cotton was approved just because of political reasons because the farmers were growing it and the farmers knew it is good for them but unfortunately the farmers could not put the same pressure on bm this bt brinjal and other crops and therefore and i i was expecting that farmers will really put pressure on the government and bt brinjal and other crops will also be released but this did not happen i published a few papers on this including one paper in nature biotechnology and couple of papers in current science which you can read where my opinions are there and i <clears throat> criticized dr swaminathan also in one of my papers and also there was another controversy when a paper was written by a colleague of dr swaminathan pc keson and swaminathan in current science and that paper was published against my wish that paper came to me for review i wrote back to the editor that this paper should be rejected without review and even then the paper was published within a month and then there was a lot of hue and cry in the in the country why this paper was published educating farmers and stakeholders for correct information about gm crops i think they know it they know it but they don't know it to the extent that they, that they will put pressure on the government this is a shortcoming educating farmers farmers do not appreciate in my opinion what loss they are undergoing because because gm crops kisans are having lot of agitation in our country i thought they had the same agitation for gm crops in the country then of course they will be benefited but this i think uh, farmers perhaps will never do but there are other reasons for which gm crops will be allowed agriculture education at the school level you can give some agriculture education at the school level but last month i gave a lecture last month or a month before in hansraj college delhi and one thing which was painful for me that botany is becoming agriculture in many places botany syllabus are by being modified mainly dominated by agriculture they want to talk about everything which agriculture is having and forgetting about botany itself this should not happen agriculture education should be taught and only elementary ag agriculture education so that those who are interested they may may shift to agriculture but not replacing botany by agriculture i am against it next please management of time attract or motivate farmers desired change in indian agriculture advice of our students you see management of time i told you that management of time is something which is very very important i always manage my time sometimes i fail but i feel sorry i told you that 7 to 7 used to be the time table in my lab at the time and i used to enjoy every minute of those 12 hours and every student also used to do that but you can do that only if you find that it is rewarding and also if you find it is enjoyable many student do research not because they enjoy it but because they want a phd degree this is something which i always criticize i told my tell my students that never do phd because it will bring you something it will bring you a job or it will bring you a... <clears throat> because phd doesn't bring a job you see 
Another very unfortunate thing in our country is that PhD thesis is never rejected. I rejected many PhD theses and I always became a victim of criticism throughout the country. So PhD thesis is never rejected in our country. This is why I, I advise supervisors also and students also finish and submit the thesis within two or three years because it will never fail. And the student may or may not utilize but he, he learned during, during his PhD. So management of time is important for those who enjoy research, who want to make progress and take research and, and, wow. and the subject of agriculture or genetics as a career, but not for those. You see, many of my students were such that they thought that they cannot really follow what I want them to follow. And therefore, they, can, they, they left. Many students sometimes can come to me and tell me that he, he's not enjoying it. So if, if a student comes and tells me he's not enjoying it, I always advise him to quit. I don't uh, tell, them, tell him that he should continue. Attract or motivate farmers. I think extension activities should improve. Extension activities are poor in our country. There are full extension departments in agricultural university, but they are not doing the job. They are not doing the job. And therefore, extension activities should improve. And these extension workers should have full knowledge about what they had to tell the farmers. Desired change in agri Indian agriculture, I don't have much to say. Desired change. But one thing which I want to say is that whenever there is an important discovery anywhere in the world, we take five to ten years to adopt it. In comparison to China, they adopted the very same year. I remember I published a paper on, on base editing some few years ago. Base editing was uh, <clears throat> initiated in 2016 by a scientist at Harvard and China immediately took up. Any activity or any research which is the most important research anywhere in the world, China is the, is the first to follow. China may not be the first to start or discover the technique, but China is the first to adopt. And we never do it. We never do it. We never do it because innovation, innovation is not there in our blood. Even the most important and the most eminent scientists in our country, they are not innovative. They will never develop a new technique. For example, my student Rajiv Varshne also, you see, he did a lot of work in volume, but never gave anything new to the, to the world. In the sense, technology, next generation sequencing, genome editing, all these techniques were developed and new techniques are developed almost every year and China took take precedence over India for, for example, many softwares, hundreds and thousands of softwares have been developed for conducting research, hardly any developed in India. Mostly the software which are developed, I keep on telling my colleagues and also people at Indian Agricultural Statistical Research Institute, that develop the software, new software for doing something new. So software, development of software is not an area of a major emphasis in our country. Although databases have been developed, we also developed a database. Development of databases has been an active area of research, but development of software for dealing with the problem. You see, there's so much of data available. How to utilize this data? You need software. All kinds of software are needed to make full use of the data which is available. This is not done. Advice for students and scholars. I have, I always have a lot of advice for students and scholars. One of the advice which I like to give to the students is, don't follow PhD just because you want to have the degree. Because large number of my PhD students are not having good jobs even after PhD. Because they did not have a passion 
for doing research. So you should do research only if you enjoy teaching and research. You should continue for research if it gives you pleasure, if it is enjoyable, and if there are not for the job. Large number, of, therefore, ninety percent of our students don't get suitable job uh, for for their PhD degree, and therefore, you should do research. But in some cases, like my own career, I did not pursue research for a job. This is why I took up a job before PhD, before doing PhD. But then, once a job was assigned to me, I worked hard to follow that career and took it as a challenge to make it a success. You see, even if you have not selected an area of research, even if you have selected to do your PhD, not by choice, but by because you didn't have anything else to do. One of our vice chancellor used to say that MPhil PhD is a postponement of unemployment. Many of our students don't get a job. After MSc, therefore, they do PhD, they do MPhil. But once you get a chance to do your MPhil or PhD and got an idea of continuing studies, then you should take up it as a challenge, do it, make full use of the time. Grab the opportunity. This is what I tell my students. Whenever you have an opportunity, you have to grab the opportunity. When I teach MSc students, 70-80% of students don't listen to me. Only 20-30% of students listen. But they do not know how, what they are losing. What they are losing. So students have to make full use of a teacher like me. They don't. Usually they don't. And whenever they get an opportunity, they should grab the opportunity and make full use and take help from wherever it is available. Large number of papers we have published by seeking help from Delhi. From Delhi, IERI, then Plant Molecular Biology, Delhi, South Delhi campus. So take help from anybody who is around and knows it. But once you start taking up research or PhD course as a career, then you should make full use of it. 80-90% of students don't do it. I think that is the last one. Is it the last one? If it is the last one, I think I have already... Yes, already, it's the last one. Probably. Already spent, a, spent an hour, but I am available for another hour for question and answer. If... No problem. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, sir. Uh, actually, you have already covered what were our planning for the question answer. Now we can discuss a little bit uh, because uh, many students are joined, uh, Many uh, few of them already uh, in your class when you taught in your university. So they, so they are very excited. Uh, and uh, uh, right now, currently 614 people are watching you live. Okay. So very, very much, uh, very, many people are asking suggestions like uh, I'm think I, I thought they are uh, in MSc or PhD careers, early careers, uh, you are already mentioned one thing is the interest. So people are asking you about uh, some suggestions of topics. So uh, obviously when they are very See, new. Another, another thing which I would like to advise students is that students when complete their MSc, they don't seriously examine the opportunities available elsewhere. They end up doing PhD with a supervisor who is available. If four persons are not available, they will go to the fifth one. So the selection of supervisor and the selection of topic is most important. You see, I remember Akhlesh Tyagi in Delhi University used to tell us, I taught him in MPhil. He was at Merit doing his MPhil on anthroculture. While consulting literature, he came across the paper of Satish Maheshwari. And therefore, he left Mirat University and moved to Delhi University because he thought that he can do much better with Satish Maheshwari than at Mirat University. And I, I also did it. I always, you see, I told you that I went, used to go to Patna 
in university to learn and i used to uh, even today we go to delhi university to learn learn whatever we don't know so the student should select the area of research and the supervisor very carefully area of research also the student normally don't select they get a phd supervisor and the supervisor tells them the problem and then they start doing it they will never question their supervisor i would always question my supervisor even he reads in england when i was working with him for a year i always used to question him so questioning your supervisor and questioning everybody who is teaching you is something which should be inherent in a person who is following ah uh, yes sir um that is very right way you they put these things but uh, yes sometime from the students it's they may, might be hesitant but yes we have to learn it that um, question means uh, scientific questions we yes, to yes. ask but asked and uh, sir uh, one one thing i want to ask you right uh, collaborations you you, uh, you did your very uh, very much you did collaborative work for yes, yes. in canada in and in more than Boston. more than what i did is an example of rajiv varshne Mm -hmm. yes. see most of his progress is because of collaboration yes yes 130 and 40 countries he yes. collaborated yes. yes so it yes. is remarkable he did much better than me so yes. far as collaboration is concerned yes yes and uh, that is expected means every PhD, every mentor uh, they want to uh, give the space of their students and ahead of him so yes uh, rajiv basne is very uh, good examples of them you see and... i also you see when when i started my work on molecular markers in 1996 then i used to do do lot of collaboration whenever i had problem i will always contact scientists abroad and and seek their help but subsequently not many people are prepared for a person sitting at merit Mm. People would normally not like to collaborate, but Rajiv Varshne fortunately was at Ikiset, which was an international center. Mm. Therefore, whenever he asked for collaboration, people came forward and joined him. Mm. Yes. So, this uh, is selection, selection of a job. I remember after working for five years in IPK Germany, he returned to India, sought my advice how to find a job. and you know what i told him i told him you don't look for a job hmm. visit places which are important deliver lecture about your work hmm. without asking for a job job will be offered okay, okay. you see he, he i sent him before he completed his phd i went to sent him to attend the crop science congress in germany and when he was going there before his phd i told him don't come back after making your presentation hmm. you have to go visit places and make presentations and he did that and when he came back even before his phd he had four or five post doctoral fellowships people were were competing for having him and it became difficult for him to make a choice and then once again it was hard for him to to make a choice and i told him don't leave cereals maximum you can shift from wheat to barley but don't don't move to other crops so this is how he went to ipk okay and so said uh, there is my personal question so uh, i i'm working only on jute so what is your thought on that you see you may work on any crop but work to the level mm. that nobody else is doing what you are doing mm. you see when molecular markers we started mm. many of my friends told me i will fail okay. and then i demonstrated that i can do it in merit you see because when i took up 
this project, this this project, I did not make a choice. Wheat biotechnology. This was given by DBT. Mm -hmm. But and they gave it because they knew that I know wheat, wheat crop. And we had five or six institutions in the country in that multi institutional project, and none of them could do as well as I did, because I knew wheat. I knew wheat cytogenetics, and I could I could utilize molecular markers to the extent that nobody else could do. Hmm. So when you work on any crop, work to the extent that people start recognizing you as world authority on that subject. Hmm. Yes, sir. it's a nice suggestion. Um, uh, Tamina, do you want to ask something? So I, uh, I'll... Yes, I have some question for uh, Professor. Uh, yes. Hey, Gupta, sir, uh, would you please uh, switch on your video because I think it's switched off. I, I can't see you. Say, say it again. Yes, sir. Your video is off, sir. Can you put your camera on? My, oh, my camera is not on? No. No. I, we don't think so. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. right now. Right now. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's good. Okay. Tamina, go ahead. Yes, sir. I have some several questions from the audience also and from our side. Uh, so you have shared your amazing journey and I was just listening every part of journey, you know, that it was just moving forward to the newer and to the new thing. So, sir, would you please uh, comment or what is it your take on genome editing? Because you have already mentioned that uh, you, you have um, uh, published a paper on base editing and everything. So yes, what yes, yes. About you, see, you see, sometimes in your career, you feel attracted by what is being published in nine, in 2017 or 18 i remember i always read in december what was the best work done in that year by whom and what is the best best research which will be followed in the next year so in 2016 after 2016 into 2017 I saw a person from, uh, from, from USA, Dr. Lee, I think, I don't remember, David, David Lu or David Lee. And Gene Changer was the title given in that article by Nature. Gene Changer, Dr. David Lu. And mm -hmm. because I was interested in genetics, I, I picked up. And I found that he, he proposed gene editing for the first time. And I was so excited that I thought that the student should know it, reader should know it. Therefore, I started writing an article. And I, in 2018, I delivered a lecture in February 2018 in the University of Dharwad. Everybody was surprised. Even Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh from IRI, he thought we never knew about it. Mm -hmm. And then he invited me to IRI to deliver the same lecture. Mm -hmm. So you... I think there are not many people who feel excited about reading something new and then understanding it and teaching. Mm -hmm. But I have this passion. Whenever I find something, then I always like to learn and teach about it. For example, I delivered a lecture in Bardwan. The title mm -hmm. of the lecture was Spatiotemporal Organization of Chromatin and Genomics. Genome. A very important topic. You see, I went to Australia to attend this PAG Australia. 50% of the lectures were on this topic. A spatio-temporal organization. Organization for regulation of gene expression. Not for a, any other reason. So, this type of topics, when you come across, do you feel excited about it? Many times just, you just ignore, okay, forget about it. But I normally don't do it. If I have time, I would like to learn. Mm -hmm. And when I learn, I feel like writing. And when I write, I like to feel, I feel like, like giving a lecture on the topic. To be frank, sir, it's uh, very nice that you have the capability or instinct for writing. You know, like most of uh, us, uh, I, for, for me, I like to read, that's for sure. But... For me, sometimes, you know, for writing, maybe I'm kind of skeptical. So, but uh, for your case, you are always mentioning that you are very much... Fortunately, because of Google Scholar, you are much better placed now. Mm -hmm. True. You, can, you can find everything in the world yes. just on a click. Mm -hmm. Therefore, 
there is no reason. You see, when I read a paper, mm -hmm. the paper mentions about earlier papers, mm -hmm. then I go through those earlier papers, and then earlier papers go to the root of the problem in this manner. Mm -hmm. And you should feel excited about it. You sleep in the night, get to the bed with a plan for next day. Right in the morning, my wife sometimes tells me that I don't allow her, <laughs> allow her to sleep till late. But I normally, this is why many people tell me that why, what time do you get up? Once I wrote a, an email to, uh, to, what was the name of this? Vice Chancellor of, of Punjab Agricultural University, I forgot his name. I wrote an email to him at 2 a.m. And he wrote me back, do you sleep so late or get up so early? <laughs> yeah. Sir, is there any project nowadays that like you are overseeing it? Like, uh, Is there any project you are working on nowadays, specifically? No, no. No, this uh, research project I don't have now. Mm -hmm. Because funding agencies told me that I am too, too old. <laughs> okay. Sir, I have some questions from the audience. Like, uh, um, few questions are regarding uh, uh, because most of uh, our audience are from students and they are they want to know about your experience and everything. So, some questions are regarding as well for the farmers. So, uh, I would like to know your opinion about the farmer education because one of our uh, audience. Yes, I, I told you that extension activity is very very important. Mm -hmm. Extension activity is very very important. One of my students tells me always that he wants to have a career to go to the farmer and tell them what is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. He is passionate about it. And mm -hmm. I am surprised that not many students would like to do that. Mm -hmm. Education of farmers, you see, whatever education they already have, you can always tell them more. Mm -hmm. Tell them more. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, you have mentioned that you so many crops and you already mentioned that you have suggested Dr. Varshane to stay with the cereal crops and everything. So what is your specific, um, you know, favorite crop you to you work on? Like mostly no, no, no crop, I told, I told Majumdar also, crop is not important. You see, in India, when he got a job, you see, when he came back from IPK, he delivered lecture at, at uh, NIPGR, he gave lecture at DNA Fingerprinting Institute, CCMB, and so many places. And then he ended up with Ikriset. And he sought my advice. I said, Ikriset is the best place. But mm -hmm. then, Ikriset wheat was not there. Mm -hmm. so he had no option. But then, pulses was very important there. But he opted by compulsion, I think, that he will have to work on pulses. But he demonstrated then that he could work on pulses and demonstrate to the world that he could do what nobody else could do so far. About a dozen genome sequence by him on pulses. Mm. Remarkable, you see. Nobody yeah. else could do it. This is why he became, became a virus. Mm. So he had to work on pulses because wheat was not available to him. But once he decided to work on pulses, he demonstrated that he's the best best person on pulses in the world. Yes. Wow, that's true. So there is another question from one of the uh, audience. He said, like, um, he exactly asked that whenever you, have you ever faced any barriers during your research evolution from cytogenetics to function and applied genomics during your early years of career? No, opportunity. I was lucky. I always had opportunities available. So I told you that I had very few failures, therefore. So opportunity. You see, for example, after retirement, I thought I will be doing only book writing, reading and writing. But then Dr. Bhatia called me and, and gave me this challenging workshop. You see, when, when he gave me money, there were four or five other institutes involved. He had to cut short their money and give it to me. And everybody was annoyed with me that this man came from nowhere and is getting funds from our own share. But then, you see, 
once I got it, I think I told my students also, including Rajiv Varshne, that this is the question of life and death for me. I have to demonstrate that I can do it. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, for this question, because you asked some personal questions like regarding on his research, and I have also some questions because uh, many of our students from Bangladesh also listening to you through the YouTube, and they have so much of interest of your research because they learn uh, and they read used to uh, they used to read your books for cytogenetics very well. Uh, you have mentioned that you have visited Bangladesh and specifically Department of Botany uh, twenty years back. So can you just share some of the words like or some of the experience on that time? You see, one thing, the lecture which I'm going to deliver at Calcutta on May 24th mm -hmm. is teaching of plant cytogenetics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving this lecture because 90% of botany departments don't know what is cytogenetics, what how cytogenetics differs from cytology and mm -hmm. genetics. Mm -hmm. Cytogenetics is its own discipline. It is not combination of cytology and genetics. Mm -hmm. And it was established long time ago when Barbara McClintock discovered a CDS system. Mm -hmm. So this, you see, therefore, tell me what is cytogenetics, if you know. How uh -huh. does it differ from cytology and genetics? I give you an example. Mm -hmm. Suppose you are having a population, mutagenic population. Mm -hmm. And in this population, you study chromosomes, you study meiosis, and you also study genes, mutations. Mm -hmm. So you are doing both cytology and genetics. Does it make cytogenetics? Not really. It does not. Mm -hmm. This is the example which I give to my students also. Mm -hmm. Cytogenetics is not cytology plus genetics. And with all due respect to Professor A.K. Sharma, he is no more now, he never did cytogenetics. Mm -hmm. He did cytology, chromosome research. Mm -hmm. Excellent work. And monumental work which nobody else can do. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book also on chromosome technique which is still considered to be a Bible all over the world. But then he did not do cytogenetics. In my opinion, he did not do cytogenetics. And I myself did not know the difference till I visited Canada. Mm -hmm. Because that was the best center on cytogenetics anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So would you please uh, like uh, uh, highlight some of the differences between because you say you learn some of them? No, I'm asking like, would you please highlight uh, the difference between cytology and cytogenetics? Because I'm sure some of my colleagues from cytogenetics laboratory in Bangladesh See, Listening to you. Cytogenetics, I explain it with the help of ACDS system. Mm -hmm. You see, when Barbara McClintock was studying ACDS system, then she came across number of cobs on corn, which were all variegated. Some, some grains were white, yellow, others were black, brown, and she was surprised and she wanted to find out the reason. And then she studied the Paketin studies. You see, Paketin, not many of us do. Even Eka Sharma never did it. Mm -hmm. And during Paketin, she found that there were deletions in chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And when she studied it further, she found that there is a breakage, fusion breakage cycle. You see, when there is a duplication, crossing over takes place within the chromosome, which leads to a bridge formation, and this bridge breaks somewhere, leading to production of sticky ends, and this cycle continues. And this Cycle continues in some cells and not in others. So some grains are variegated, some are not. And then, then she examined the paketin in many of many of these plants, and she found that the breakage in chromosome nine takes place at the same position in all of them. 
that led her to discover the DS, dissociation locus. So this is this is cytogenetics. And you see, I tell you another story. Dr. E. R. Sears. Mm -hmm. Ernie Sears in 1935, he did his PhD. And he came across three haploid plants. He was making a crosses between wheat and rye with the hope that some characters will be transferred from wheat, rye to wheat. And he got three haploid plants. And he thought, you see, haploids are, don't give any seed. So he thought, what to do with it? He mm -hmm. crossed these haploid plants using pollen from diploid plants, normal plants. And he got a monosomic. Mm -hmm. And I remember in one of the international wheat genetic symposium, he was delivering inaugural lecture. And he said, I got a monosomic. And it was difficult for me to stop there. You see, that was so exciting for him that he spent all his life on, on a new plot. So many a times you come across something which leads you. For example, we started work on, on these SSRs. Mm -hmm. When we started work on SSRs, we started with single marker analysis and we first found a marker which was responsible for protein content. Single marker analysis, nobody does it now. And nobody will publish a paper. But our first paper was published in 1998 on this single marker analysis where we used regression approach. And then we thought that we should map this gene, this marker. First, we thought that we should know the chromosome on which it is located. This occurred to me that we can use nullisomic tetrasomics for this purpose. We got nullisomic and tetrasomics free at the time. So using nullisomic tetrasomics, we could find the chromosome on which it is located. Then I thought we should know on which arm. So we use dietylocentrics. I knew dietylocentrics are available. We should have the knowledge also. And once we got the arm using dietylocentrics, when, then we thought that we should know the position and therefore mm -hmm. we used deletions. 400 deletions were available in wheat. You see, and this is how from one question to another, you ultimately go deep and then one of my students mapped 2000 SSRs. Physical map. Do you know the difference between genetic and physical map? Mm -hmm. Sir, you can elaborate actually, yes. You see, there are three types of maps. There are linkage maps, which were Morgan and his group developed linkage maps. Linkage maps are based on recombination. You don't care on which chromosome a gene is located. Therefore, linkage map is a straight line on which genes are located, separated by distances, which are proportionate to recombination frequencies. So every linkage map is a straight line. We do not know which chromosome does it belong. Mm -hmm. Then you want to assign the linkage graph maps to chromosomes. That is cytogenetics. Mm -hmm. Then you want to assign and therefore you get cytogenetic maps. You know now which linkage group belongs to which chromosome. But once you have located them on chromosomes, you want to know what is the physical position because the genetic position is based on recombination frequencies. So in linkage map and cytogenetic maps, <clears throat> you place the genes separated by distances which are proportionate to recombination frequencies without knowing their physical positions. And if the recombination positions, recombination frequencies differ in different parts, then their physical position will not match the genetic distance at the Morgans. So then you try to make use of deletions and other aneuploids to find the physical position, which means, means that you will say that this gene is located on short arm at a distance of one fourth from the centromere. This mm -hmm. is physical map. Now we, now we can convert it into megabase. 
because mm-hmm. we know the sequences. Mm-hmm. We know the sequences. Earlier, physical maps which we used to prepare, we used to say, "This." Uh, <clears throat> I told you that uh, one of my student prepared physical maps of two thousand SSRs. Mm-hmm. We did not place them mega mega base pairs because sequences were not known at the time. So mm-hmm. we placed them. A particular arm divided into 10 parts, one tenth, two tenths. So we always place them at a position proportionate segment of an arm. This is cytogenetics. Mm-hmm. Not many people understand it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Sir, some students are asking, like uh, Samita Dayal, she asked that to suggest some emerging areas, uh, area of research in cytogenetics. She wanted to ask, like, what could be done in the in now if the area of you know, you see, for example, you see one of the areas which we are thinking actually from NBPGR, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, one of our old students, Sandeep Kumar, he approached me to suggest a problem like you are asking. And he told me that he has whole genome sequences of more than 200 feet which accessions and he doesn't know what to do with it. So I told him several options. One of the options which I suggested is post GWAS studies. You see genome wide association mapping. Do you understand what is genome wide association studies? Many many of you do not know, unfortunately. You see, this is why when I teach a course on quantitative genetics and I teach interval mapping and I also te- teach association mapping. Only last week I was teaching my students. But this interval mapping and association mapping, 90% of teachers also don't know, unfortunately. Whenever I go to the university, I ask teachers, who is teaching quantitative genetics? And one teacher will say, I am teaching. I asked her, do you teach interval mapping and association mapping? No, sir. The question is, and this is why I wrote a book on continuity genetics two or three years ago with the intention that teachers and students will be benefited. And that book is not selling because even the teachers don't want to read it because they will have to make effort to read and learn and then teach. This is what a teacher doesn't want to do. So many of the areas of research emerge Mm -hmm. from the questions which you ask yourself when you do research. For example, at least a dozen students in my lab have done this internal mapping and association mapping. Mm -hmm. And then (coughs) in one of the task forces of DBT, I was the chairman of the task force. The DBT asked me, sir, association mapping we should invite proposals on association mapping. And we advertised. We received about 100 projects on association mapping. And then I conducted the meeting. We shortlisted some of them, projects, about 10 of them. And the principal investigators of those projects did not know what is association mapping. I asked them this question. You have submitted a project on association mapping. Do you know what it is? I asked them, do you know what is multiple testing? None of them knew. Mm -hmm. Then Ashok Kumar Singh, who is the director of IRI, asked me, sir, you should write a review for us. Mm -hmm. Then we will learn. Mm -hmm. So I wrote two reviews on association mapping. One was published in 2014 and another was published in 2019. The review which I published in 2019 is in post GWAS. <clears throat> you see, there are a number of shortcomings in association mapping. Mm-hmm. You want to address them. Mm-hmm. And how to address them? This is post GWAS. You find out a marker, but you do not know which is the causal arg- causal gene or marker. Mm-hmm. You only know a marker which is associated with a trait, located at a distance from the gene and we do not know what is the distance. Somewhere it should be there. 
So why should we not, after Jiva's study, when we ident we, we call the marker trait associations. You mm -hmm. are identifying the marker which is associated with the trait without knowing anything about the gene. Mm -hmm. So one of the studies in future can be to know these markers with which gene or with which sequence, what are, what are the causal SNPs which are responsible for the trait. So in every research area, you can always ask future questions. I always do it. And mm -hmm. this is how I kept on making progress in different areas. Mm -hmm. We always point out the limitations of a particular technique, mm -hmm. but never like to address them. So this NBPGR project, we we already had about dozen meetings on mm -hmm. that on that project. How to utilize genome sequences? Mm -hmm. They have more than two hundred resequenced genomes, and he doesn't know what to do with it. So mm -hmm. we are planning. Every meeting makes a progress, but we are planning what to do, which nobody has. Nobody else has done. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for me, I always have ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, uh, uh, based on the planning, I wanted to ask you that if, for example, me, Tamina, we are, uh, we are wanted to edit a book on a topic like it? Genome, genome editing uh, of Jew. Tell me, what are, the, what are the prerequisites for genome editing? Uh, um, uh, okay, sir. So, so uh, first, uh, I I'll ask you. Uh, I'll come to your question first. Uh, question. My question is that I we need a suggestion from you that how we plan it. No, means... but have you read enough about genome editing? You see, uh, one of the major problem is with hmm. our students and teachers, they don't read enough. Hmm. Even no, when so, they write, so is to start from the reading. Then yes. we find out find yes. out the problem and gaps. Yes. Then we then we find example, out the authors. For example, I tell you, mm -hmm. in our department also we are we were trying to develop a project on genome editing, and mm -hmm. my colleagues came to me, sir, how to how to get it started. You see, first you should know the trait which you want to improve. Okay. The trait should be such, which cannot be dealt with by conventional plant breeding. Mm -hmm. Only then you have the advantage. Mm -hmm. Something which can be done by conventional plant breeding or marker assisted selection. Mm -hmm. Why do it? Ah, obviously. So first you have to select a, a, a problem, a character. Mm -hmm. And suppose we select draw tolerance. Mm -hmm. Because it is a difficult, although conventional plant breeding can do it. But conventional plant breeding largely failed so far. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we thought that we should do genome editing. For genome editing, one of the prerequisites is that you should know the gene. Hmm. You have to select a gene. Hmm. Suppose you have 100 genes. How will you select one from them for genome editing? Hmm. The most important requirement is that you, you should know the sequence of that gene. Hmm. Genes should have been cloned. Genes hmm. should have been sequenced. And in this sequence, you should know the the nucleotide, which is causal, which you would like to edit. Yeah. So have you done this prerequisite? Hmm. Select the trait, select the gene, and then find out the causal hmm. nucleotide, which is responsible for the trait, which you want to edit. Okay. Then you will develop card, card sequence, Hmm. By guide sequence. Hmm. So you have to. So, in order to do this, the most important thing is that you should know the trait, you should know the gene, and you should also know. You see, suppose you have cloned the gene and you have the sequence of the gene, but you do not know which, which SNP, which nucleotide you have to alter. Huh. You have to know it. Hmm. Yes. To get the maximum advantage of editing. Yes, yes. Because sometimes we start, I've seen many people, they get funds for a project without understanding it, and then they learn while doing the research, <laughs> without doing homework. 
So then and sir, chances of failures are very high. Yeah. And uh, sir, for the edited book, uh, if we uh, if someone plan for the some ed editor, uh, his role will be the editor. I am I am against I am against editing books. Okay, so this is, ask, this is ask that, that is the reason that ask, we because, ask me why. Uh, why? <laughs> when, when many of my colleagues tell me, hmm. you see, you you know the name Chitranjan Kole? Yes. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, I. Two hundred books I he has edited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these editors who have edited these books, mm. I ask them one question. Hmm. Have you ever rejected any invited article? Hmm. Hmm. All of them say no. Hmm. A paper which nobody is capable of publishing in a good journal, he will hmm. submit it to an edited book. Okay. Because he can't publish it elsewhere. Hmm. And he knows that it will be published in the edited book. Hmm. So, you see, I, I edited books. I edited one book with Swaminathan, okay. Cytogenetics of Crop Plants. Mm. That was in 19, uh, that was in 1983. Mm. And there are about 20 chapters on different crops in this book. Mm. And they are, each chapter is written by a world authority. Mm. Okay. But I read every word in every chapter. And sometimes, sometimes return the chapter to the author, asking him hmm. to revise. Okay. Another, another special issue I edited for National Academy of Science, Allahabad, on hmm. epigenetics. Okay. And we invited articles. Hmm. One of the article which was submitted by Sushil Kumar. Hmm. Have you heard of that name? No, sir. I Sushil didn't. Kumar was the director of CIMAP. Okay. He was uh, he is a Santi Saru Bhattagar Awardi. Ah, he, he is no more now. So Sushil Kumar, we requested him to write a write a lecture, write a, a chapter. Hmm. And he wrote a long chapter with dozens of uh, figures. Hmm. And Rakesh Tuli was another editor with me. Ah, I, I know Rakesh Tuli. So Rakesh Tuli said, Ke Dok Saab, ye iska article lamba bhi hai, to isko kaise handle kare? Mm. To, I said, send it to, send it to me. Mm. So I read that article and reduced it to half, eliminating many figures, mm. and then I sent it back to Sushil Kumar. Mm. Are he... He was furious. He said, how, yeah. could, how yeah. could you do this to an invited, invited chapter? You first invite and then do this yeah. nonsense? Yeah. <laughs> I said, Sushil Kumar, not only I am asking you to revise and I, I have revised it for you. So, yeah. reducing your work. But perhaps you do not know that I can also reject it. Invitation does not mean mm. it will be accepted. Mm. So, edit a book. You see, Rajiv Vashni also. He has edited mm. so many books, but he never mm. reads any chapter. Mm. He doesn't have the time. Not that he's not capable of doing it. He doesn't, mm. because he engages himself in so many activities. Mm. If he's editing a book, he has no time. He edited two books with me also, Serial Genomics. Okay. By, while working with him, I, I found that he never read any chapter. Mm -hmm. So if you want to edit a good book mm -hmm. on a topical subject, mm -hmm. select a topic, mm -hmm. select authors who are outstanding in their area, Okay. and then read the paper, send them for review mm -hmm. to good reviewers. Mm -hmm. You see, one of the edited book of Jute. Yes, mm. I come to Jute. <laughs> Chitranjan Kole has edited a book of Jute. Uh, Jute Genomics, I think. And he mm. asked me to write a chapter because I published some papers. Mm. So I asked my student Riaz Mir. Mm. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that name? Ah, yes. I so 
So Riaz Bir transferred this responsibility to another student <laughs> who, who did her PhD with me, Mom, Momita, Momita. <laughs> so these two persons, Riaz and Momita, wrote the chapter and sent it to me. Okay. I asked them, Riaz, you are not as bad as the chapter is. You can do, <laughs> you can do much better. <laughs> तो वो बोला साहब मैंने सोचा डॉक्टर साहब आप ठीक कर देंगे <laughs> मैंने कहा देखो ये तो बुक चैप्टर जो है हम्म ये एमएससी स्टूडेंट्स के लिए भी बेकार है ओके okay. हम्म और इफ आई हैव टू डू इट आई विल आई विल हैव टू रीराइट द होल चैप्टर देयरफॉर इट इज बेटर दैट यू पब्लिश इट विदाउट माय नेम ओके आई रिमूव्ड माय नेम फ्रॉम द ऑथरशिप and the chapter was published okay. <laughs> so you, you should have a particular uh, idea and thought mm. about writing book mm. after all when you are editing a book it is not because you want to have a list on your uh, biography or curriculum vitae that you have edited so many books mm. you would like to edit a book with a purpose and also with a purpose to learn while editing Hmm. Most of us do not do that. Chitranjan Kohli ki jo 200 volumes hai, they are all trash. Hmm. In my opinion, hmm. and he did it because he he was incapable of doing research. This is why he he, he did it. Hmm. So edit a book. You see, I told you that I edit a book on two books on civil journalism, one book on this, and hmm. and volumes for Alzheimer, hmm. chromosome engineering. In in plants, hmm. but I spent a few years on every volume. Okay, it is not that you are getting the chapter, sending it for review. You are not a post office. Hmm. You are receiving and sending it to reviewer, and then then sending it to the to the publisher. Hmm. Most people who do editing, edit books, they are only working as a post office. And, Unfortunately, hmm. so do it. Do it with a purpose. You should be able to. You should learn something by doing it. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. This is why I don't edit books. Okay. 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 Yes. A lot of takeaway takeaway messages you have given to us, and uh, my, uh, are you always that state forward? <laughs> or now after retirement you it's make you more state forward no 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 i i i follow it you see uh, when 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 we were felicitating rajiv varshne in iri hmm. i said that he has followed many of my habits hmm. and working habits but he excels me in two One is that he is more hardworking than me. I am hardworking, but he is he works more than me. And second is that he doesn't like to criticize anybody. I like to criticize everybody. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Actually, they are, we were discussing already, but some of the questions were already about the ethics in publication. Not only in publication, also ethical consideration and implications in genome editing and everything. But I think Professor Gupta, ethics, Gupta, ethics, Gupta, ethics is very important. You see, this is why every student in my department, even today, even if he is a PhD student with somebody else, he brings in the end the manuscript to me. Sir, can you examine it? Hmm. Because majority of cases, you see, when you when you write a sentence, do hmm. you really read it again to find out whether any word is necessary or not? Hmm. Whether you, whether you try to find out whether this sentence has information which requires consultation of literature. When a student comes to me, he has to sit with me, and I consult dozens of papers in the literature before finalizing any manuscript. Okay. Majority of teachers don't do it; they leave it mm -hmm. on the student, 
And when mm. I do it, I find so many mistakes. The student has written something, cited a paper, which does not have that information. Okay. Mm. So do you really verify mm. that the paper which you have cited does have the information which you for which you have cited the paper? Mm. Many, in many cases, this is not true. I can tell you. Many cases, it is not true. So this is this is the problem. You see, once Rajiv Vashna sent me a paper which he published, and I started reading, and in the introduction itself, I found a blunder. He wrote just the opposite. He wrote association mapping has high power and low resolution, hmm. and it is just the other way around. Actually, mm -hmm. association mapping has high resolution and low power. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote back to him, Are Rajiv, and I ke, I teach my students just the opposite. Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, this is also this is this is ethics. This mm -hmm. is ethics. Mm -hmm. If somebody is pointing out your mistake. Why should you feel ashamed of telling that, yes, sir, thank you very much for pointing out the mistake? Hmm. Yeah, true. That's very hmm. Another, another, I give you another example. Hmm. You see, one of the terminology, I don't know, I, I hope Rajiv is not there. <laughs> <laughs> is he there? <laughs> Rajiv Ashna is watching? No, no, I, uh, I don't no, think. A so. lot of adverts of Dr. Varshni is there. I'm but, sure. but, but, uh, whatever he is, your student. No so, problem. He published a review article on trends in plant science. Mm -hmm. Excellent article. And one of the term, one term which he introduced is genomics based breeding, plant breeding, genomics based breeding. And this was in the title of that paper in Trends in Plant Science. Mm -hmm. I wrote back to the editor that I want to write a criticism on this paper. Mm -hmm. And that foolish lady forwarded I, my email to Rajiv Varshney, mm -hmm. who is the editor, <laughs> asking him what is happening. Your own teacher wants to criticize you. <laughs> and so it, so it, it is not it is also not ethical. No, it's not also yes. ethical. And immediately I received a phone call. Mm. Rajiv. Mm. Doc Sab ye kya kar rahe hai? <laughs> Maine ka dekho, Rajiv. Galat kar raha hu to badlao. Mm. I feel that you are wrong and I want to bring it to the notice of the audience. Mm -hmm. And you also. And you should appreciate it. Arey sahab, usne telephone chhoda nahi jab tak maine ye nahi keh diya ki nahi lukunga matters. In contrast to this, in contrast to this, I tell you another thing. I, Dr. Swaminathan was very fond of Evergreen Revolution. Ha. And he wrote a book also on Evergreen Revolution. Hmm. That book came to me for review by Current Science. Okay. I wrote, I wrote a review. And you see, I have great regard. Swaminathan helped me at so many places. And mm -hmm. he was a remarkable person. I derive a lot of inspiration from him. But he talks too much. Sometimes not practical. Mm -hmm. So after a page of appreciation for his contribution, I wrote that Dr. Swaminathan has been talking about our green revolution for the last 10 years. Hmm. I was expecting that something will come out. <laughs> Either Swaminathan will take steps to bring it to breeding, hmm. to release it, or he will stop. Hmm. Nothing happened. He still keeps on talking about our green revolution. Hmm. And and he, he started criticizing green revolution. Hmm. So I wrote that green revolution, of course, did harm to the environment. But hmm. did we have an op option? Hmm. It was a necessary evil. 
ट्रांसपेरेशन में पढ़ाते हैं ना हम स्टूडेंट्स को ट्रांसपेरेशन इज ए नेसेसरी इविल ट्रांसपेरेंट नहीं करना चाहता लेकिन करना पड़ता है उसको बड़े जबरदस्त यस तो साहब स्वामी को करंट साइंस का ये रूल है कि करंट साइंस सेंड्स द क्रिटिसिज्म टू द ऑथर एंड पब्लिश द ऑथर्स कमेंट्स आल्सो ओके एंड स्वामी नाथन कमेंट्स वर आल्सो पब्लिश अलोंग विद माय क्रिटिसिज्म Hmm. And Swaminatha wrote that I appreciate very much the criticism written by Professor P K Gupta. In most of the criticism, he is only appreciating me, so no comments are needed there. Hmm. And he writes that every person has has the freedom of writing the idea which comes to my to his mind. and i did the same and signed and outstanding scientist like pk gupta hmm. also has the freedom to criticize okay okay hmm. and he stopped he stopped using the term global green revolution after that hmm aapne dekha hoga death se pehle hmm for about 10 years he was not talking about it hmm So mm-hmm. there are people like Swaminathan who would accept the criticism positively. Mm-hmm. There are people like my dear Rajiv Gosne who doesn't like criticism. Who tarif 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 chata hai. Oh, it's it's usual. But uh, sorry, these are very nice experiences that you shared. Uh, hey. We have learned a lot, not only about the science journey that you have, or also about the experiences that you have. as an editor or a writer of the many chapters of the book or book and also as a public pub, uh, authors of so many publications so from my side i think i'm done with the question yes 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 uh yes we are covered two hours sir and uh, it's like a just just <laughs> times uh, flies and i hope Please. i hope uh, four five hours will be not enough to talking to you uh let's see sir if you uh, i am planning yes. to reach calcutta university for attending that uh, that event that's uh, symposium okay, okay. yes okay. so let let's see if it is there then i very get... much i i enjoy talking to both of you uh, thank you thank you thank you yes yes it's our pleasure it's our pleasure we are we are read 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 your book but uh, you are more more interesting <laughs> <laughs> books do not give so much idea <laughs> yeah, like yes. i was say two hours just fly i actually i didn't realize that it has already passed two hours like talking to you is very much interactive and you uh, mm-hmm. actually lights on so many uh, aspects so it it was very enjoyable from from my side i think the audience will also like okay, this yes, like... yes mm-hmm. audience are uh, audience are also enjoying and they are sending the emojis of laughing Okay. and sometimes yes. they are laughing and still there is a, a few uh, 300 plus audience are there because uh, i already gave the link for certificate application so people are going to do that thing but uh, is uh, once once upon time there is a 600 plus people are lively watching you and uh, this uh, this um, uh, whole session will record it and available here okay. so uh, in in youtube uh, but uh, we we appreciate your uh, acceptance and uh, help guided us you Thank you me. give us very very important some uh, lessons we will keep it in our whole life we will uh, try to remembering you when we got <laughs> something when uh, and uh, i i always criticize means uh, when i review i i i put many many comments uh, like uh, in, during the review for the betterment of that paper but uh, now i'll more critics <laughs> i will do more criticize <laughs> okay. sometime i i i for uh, sometime i thought that should i mention that there is should be a comma there is set of uh, this type of thing but uh, if we are not giving that type of thing then writing will not so beautiful so yes sir and uh, we'll keep it touch uh, and uh, as you uh, work also in jude and i'm totally working on jude so uh, i will send you my paper when available and uh, we'll keep in touch sir 
Uh, thanks, thanks, Tamina. Thanks, all the audience uh, okay, for like participation in today's webinar. It's so fruitful, and two hours is gone. So, mm -hmm. okay, let's end that session. Thank you, Tamina, for you. Help, helping me out uh, in six twenty. Uh, it is the sixty fifth webinar of BioEngine. Yeah. Hopefully, it's success. Yeah, <laughs> true. Sure, I need to talk to you so you can finish the. Okay, so, so I just uh, stopped the right broadcast.